All right, the first speaker is Tyler Barhite. tell me what they think it means to find yourself. And I actually want people to answer this question. Does nobody know what it means to find yourself? Meditation on a mountain for five years. That's one way to do it. All right. Anybody else? Turn on the lights. Okay. So, uh, I'm here to tell you that you're all wrong. So I've been doing, I was doing research on how to do a TED Talk, because um, I've never given one before, obviously. And I kept hearing the same thing, uh, which is that if you want to be a speaker on the TED stage, you should be an expert in what you're talking about. Um, the problem with that is that I'm not an expert, and I was actually kidding, I have no idea what the answer is to that question. But I still think I might have something to say. So I was just in the musical Camelot, and every year the high school musical hosts a cast rave. And at this rave, it's at a dance studio, and there's two rooms. There's the main room, which is where there's like food, and we get together and hang out. And then there's the other room, which is where uh, there's the dance goes on. And that's like a traditional ballet studio with ballet bars and mirrors, etc. So what they do is they turn off the, the big headlights, and they turn on like rave lights and blast music, and everybody goes in there and dances and have, has fun. Um, now, I don't hate dancing, but the only kind of dancing that I actually like to do is the kind that's been choreographed for three months. So you can imagine the situation that I was in when I went in. Um, so one of my good friends, Dan, is a complete nerd. Um, Thanks. <laughs> and he, I mean, he, if you ask him about like Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings, he will go on for hours telling you about it. He can, literally. He knows everything there is to know. And so I was in the middle of reading The Fellowship of the Ring, and uh, which is the first book in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and I figured that's my key to not dancing for the next three hours. I'm going to sit out here in the first room with Dan for three hours and talk to him about the Lord of the Rings. And then everyone's going to have fun. We're going to have a great conversation. Um, but 30 minutes into this, he was like, all right, I'm going to go dance. So I was out in, in the first room, and he was dancing, and I felt, I felt weird. I, I felt like... I didn't want to dance, so I just decided to, you know, kind of stay out and, and avoid eye contact with people and just be like, yeah, I'll go in in a minute. Um, and a few minutes later, actually, Dan came in, back into the first room, and he took me by the arms, and he flung the door open to the dance room and threw me into the room. And I was on my hands and knees sliding across the floor. And when I was, when I was in there, it was dark, lights were flashing, there was crazy loud music, and everyone was dancing, and everybody saw me. And for some reason, even though I was with a group of people that I loved and cherished, and I spent the last three months dancing, singing, acting, doing a bunch of crazy dumb stuff with, I felt everything in my body told me to get out of there. And so what I did was I got up, and while people were literally clawing at me, I bolted out the door, got my bag, got my coat, and went home. And my friend Paul, he knew what happened, um, because I saw him right before I left, and he sent me a text that said, hey, you know, I know you probably don't want to talk right now, but I highly recommend you give me a call. So now I'm going to take it back. Um, I was 14, and I went to Japan alone for the first time. Now, I've been to Japan seven times previously, but I had always gone with my mom or my dad or both or my brother, just to, you know, I would always go with people that I was comfortable with. And for the first time I went alone, I had family there. I didn't just kind of run the streets of Japan alone. But like, for the first time I went and I couldn't just speak English all the time. And I couldn't just rely on the people that I knew. And, and this trip was a big, life-changing experience for me. And for the first time, I, I realized that I really didn't like who I was, and that I needed to change something. So every summer since then, I have took the couple months that the school gives us off to reflect on myself and try and realize, you know, what, what did I learn that I wanted to fix, and, and establish a goal 
to fix that. I had, I had a, an, a, like an ideal version of myself that I wanted to become. So now we're going to take it back um, even further to when I was nine years old. Um, and I, I went into a film camp called Real Adventures uh, at Proctor's. And it was the first year that it was running, and I was the youngest one in the camp. And so I felt like I had to prove myself. So I decided to take on the role of being the cinematographer. So for the next two weeks, I spent every moment just putting everything that I had into making myself the best cinematographer the world has ever seen. I was like, Quentin Tarantino will be jealous. Um, I was nine, it was trash, but it was fun. Um, and it was so much fun, actually, that the film actually had a relatively large amount of success. We placed third at the National Film Festival, we went to the Boston Spa Film Festival, I got a limo ride when I was nine, I was in cargo shorts, it was disgusting, but I got a limo ride to a red carpet premiere of the film, I got interviewed on TV, interviewed in front of a director's panel on WAMC. It was, it was wild. I mean, I saw TV studios, and I hadn't even hit double digits yet. So, after that I was like, wow, that's a lot of success, and I want to keep doing that. So, I decided to start YouTube. So, I spent the next few years making vlogs and skits, um, and after that, uh, I actually hit a bump in the road. Um, I decided that success was the most important thing for me. So I was like, you know what? The best thing that I can do is do computer science, um, which was quite a change. And so I spent the next two years in high school, freshman and sophomore year, just pouring everything that I had into doing computer science. I took CompSci 1 and 2. I took AP. It was a terrible time. Um, and after that, after those two years, I realized that I hated everything about computer science. Regardless as to how many times I said I loved it, how many ideas and dreams that I had, it was awful. I hate math. I really do. Um, so I looked at myself after my sophomore year, and I said, okay, you hate what you're doing, and you're not going to do this anymore. So what do you want to do? And I was like, all right, I'm going to do film because that's what I had the original passion for. I've been doing it for years, and I still loved it. So I continued to do that, and for the next few years, I did uh, commercial work for companies, I did uh, paid gigs for photography, I made a TV commercial. Um, I did a lot, of, a lot of work. But every time I would do that, I had this idea of success. And that was really all I cared about. Um, so we come to uh, my senior year this year, and I just decide that I should just keep going with this path. because. Last summer, I was in a musical at Proctor's, I was working part-time, and my grandmother got sick in, in Japan, and I, I had to go to uh, Japan to see her, and it was a lot of emotional, taxing time. So I didn't get that time to reflect on myself that I normally do. And so I went into this year thinking, you know what, it's my senior year, I'm going to do what I want, and I'm just going to kind of go with it. But all year I felt like something was missing, and I, and I couldn't figure out what it was. Um, so we're going to take it back to the original part of the story. Uh, I, I ended up calling Paul that night. And that's when I realized um, every year I had a goal. I had, a, I had an envisioned version of myself that I wanted to strive towards and continue working to be a better person, which is what I've always told people. I always want to work to be a better person. Um, but then he asked me what I was doing this year to work on myself, and that's when I realized um, I had done nothing to work on myself. I've lost every path, and I have no goals. And so I freaked out. I was like, oh my goodness, this is the first time in my life that I've never had a path to follow. So I freaked out for a little bit, but that's when I realized the most important thing. Um, and that is, if you're trying to find something, you have to lose it first. So, my goal with this talk isn't to give you a life purpose. I don't know who you are. I might actually have a lot of you. Um, but I can't tell you what your life purpose is. I can't give you a path. Um, and if you found that through this talk, you're doing a lot better than I am. But if you ever feel lost or, or like you have a lack of purpose, maybe the first step is to realize that you've gotten to the end of your path. And you're trying to find that new path, but you keep pushing on the path that doesn't go any further. 
So if you want to find the new path, you have to first accept that you're not who that person was anymore. And that you've ended that path. And to find the new one, you have to be somewhere in the middle. So you can look for the new path. And you're going to be in limbo for a while. You're not going to know what you want to do. That's where I am. But you might realize that that is the first step that you've been looking for all along. Thank you.